And I'd like to take a moment, as I'm sure many of you might expect, to talk a little bit about our sponsors and thank them. Um, so we are sponsored today in part by Community Bank and A, and also Glens Falls National Bank and Trust Company. This event would not be made would not be possible. This whole conference this week without the SUNY Canton SBDC at Clinton Community College. They've put on a ton of the different programming. They've helped us organize this event, and we're really appreciative of all of their support and help, and to our sponsors as well. The Center for Businesses in Transition is um, is funded in part by the Northern Border Regional Commission that helps us to sort of fund the programming and the network uh, that we have of community liaisons and partners throughout the Adirondack North Country. Why are we doing this? Thousands of Adirondack North Country businesses are becoming available as business owners are thinking about retirement or career changes. Lots of people had changed plans last year because of the pandemic for other reasons um, and are thinking about how, you know, what their next career step is, where they want to live. Do they want to move out of an urban area into a more rural one? Um, do they want to change, change what they're doing and work from themselves? So a lot of folks are thinking about those steps and this is a good opportunity to introduce them to business owners who are preparing for retirement or their own changes in their life. As aspiring entrepreneurs like you who are seeking opportunities to own a business, um, we are just so excited to welcome you today and uh, talk with you about important, important things over the course of the conference. The event is designed to be a learning and networking opportunity um, for folks looking to take over a North Country business and an opportunity to empower those who live here and those who want to live here to take over businesses, to realize their dreams of business ownership. The Center for Businesses in Transition is a dynamic partnership with regional organizations, with chambers of commerce, with IDAs, with gap lenders, Lots of folks who live and work in the North Country and are focused on helping businesses and business owners. Um, I'm gonna take a moment and ask our liaisons and our lead partners right now to just put their names and their contact information in the chat box. Um, if you have questions about the Center for Businesses in Transition, please, please do reach out to them. They're here as resources. Um, and we all work very closely together um, to deal with this issue and to help people in our communities. I work at ANCA. Uh, the Center for Businesses in Transition is run and coordinated by ANCA. Uh, we are focused on growing a new economy that works for all and not just a few. Uh, we focus on food systems, energy economy, and the entrepreneurial economy. And if you're interested in supporting our work in programs like this one or the Adirondack Diversity Initiative, please consider um, reaching out to us or becoming a member of ANCA or giving directly to ABI. Uh, we are also very excited to announce another project we have in development that is really exciting, especially during this session today, talking about diversity and entrepreneurship. This week, we are unveiling that we are starting a down payment assistance forgiveness program that will help address the lack of capital that is often a barrier for low to moderate income people and Black, Indigenous, people of color. For those who can't get the loan because they don't have the capital for for the down payment, we are looking to raise over $30,000 in this first year uh, to be able to, to give those funds to someone who can take over a business, um, who just needs that leg up. If you wanna give to that fund, um, or you, know, you, you wanna talk about that later, please reach out to us. We would love to have a conversation about, about that fund. Um, and there'll be emails going out after this program in the conference um, asking people to donate. So, we are so excited um, to be able to, sorry, this is, oops, sorry, to welcome the Adirondack Diversity Initiative. Um, so they are housed here at ANCA, uh, but really, you know, this dynamic work is, is spearheaded by Nikki Hilton Patterson. Um, she's the director there and she is just killing it. She is amazing. She joined um, as the director of ADI in December, 2019. She's lived all over the world. She's incredibly smart. She is a Dr. Hilton Patterson. Um, she brings 20 plus years of experience as a community organizer, educator, activist. She, so many things. If I started telling you all about her, her credentials will be here all day. But she loves deeply. She lives her values and I just, I have, so excited and honored that she would be here to talk to us today and to sort of lead this session um, and have all of you here. Nikki, thanks for being here and and thanks for being you. Damn. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, gosh, my <laughs> head is already big, you know, with big hair and now it's like, ugh, tilting over, I'll probably fall over. 
you know. Um, I'll do a Bob Burgess um, bit for you in a minute, but anyway. Um, so thank you for being here. I want to um, thank ANCA and um, the Center for Businesses and Trans um, Transition for giving us this opportunity. Um, Danny is, I call her a managerial beast, a technocrat. She's amazingly brilliant, efficient, um, and has immense capacity. Um, but she, um, she's doing excellent work in the community and, and um, ADI is just ec ecstatic to partner in any way we can. Um, and Lauren is here too. Lauren is her partner in crime, holds down CBIT. Um, and I would like to thank um, my Anka family for being here because I was talking to um, Danny earlier about what the, the challenges, what it means for to be a black woman a black queer woman doing the work that I'm doing in this community and the ways in which the Anka family um, have just created a buffer. You understand? A support system, a safe space, a brave space for me to be able to continue to do the work. And I wanna thank my family, my Anka family for the opportunities that they have provided me to keep doing this work. All right, so today we are gonna start off real quick because we don't have a whole lot of time. We're gonna start off by um, introducing um, two um, uh, entrepreneurs, business owners who um, are, are members of the BIPOC community, okay? So we will start with um, Carla Navarra. Carla um, is the, um, a co-owner of Wilkins Agency. Carla Navarra was born in Saranac Lake, right? She graduated yeah. from um, Lake Placid High School she obtained her Bachelor's of Science in Human Services at Plattsburgh State University. She has worked in the insurance industry for 24 years at Wilkins Agency in Lake Placid. She became co-owner of Wilkins Agency in August of 2019. In her spare time, she enjoys walking and cross-country skiing, which I'm going to have to do with her now that I know this. Yes, get some Black folks up on them the, the, the slopes or uh, yes, let them know that we are here and we are not ceding territory because people don't want to see our faces. Ah, ah, there we go. All right, so let me move on. With her, and she likes to hang out with her colleague, Sandy, and spending time with her 14-year-old son, Marcus, and husband, Michael. Carla, thank you for being here and welcome. We also have Felipe Brandel. Felipe is the, is a, Felipe is a 20, 27 years old. Let me make sure to put his age down on paper. 27 years old, because he has like a baby face, right? So 27 year old Latino, um, born and raised in the South Bronx. So I'm from um, Wakefield, right? 244th Street, anybody know the Bronx? That's the end of the boroughs, right? Just before they start charging you more money to rent and own houses, you know, $10,000 <laughs> property tax and shit. Um, and so, so Felipe and I were talking about our experiences of, of, of living in the Bronx, but he's also the proud owner of um, Exclusivity Ara Adirondack LLC, a laser startup located in Lake Placid, New York. And here he writes, if you can dream it, we can make it. Si se puede. Como esta, Felipe? Good, good, good. Wonderful to be here. Okay, wonderful. <clears throat> All right, so I want to start off with my maravilloso, Carla. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Introduce yourself. Tell us about. Tell us a little bit about your background. You are um, an Adirondacker. Yeah, I am. Um, I have really enjoyed living here my whole life, even though I've left for a very short period of time, maybe a year and a half. <laughs> and um, I didn't know that I loved it so much until I left it. And so, yeah. um, the peacefulness, the ability to get in the woods at any minute um, is invaluable. It's just invaluable. And um, so even though we have, you know, lots of people here all the time, um, it just feels still like home because we have each other, but then we can also get into the woods and not be inundated with people. So yes, yes, that's um, why I'm in here. So there we that's go. That's why I love it here, really. Um, what else about me? Um, I went to school for human services. I feel like I'm helping people when I sell them insurance. I don't know if that's anyone else's take, but that's mine. Um, I, I love insurance and um, I feel like it's, it's an opportunity to learn every day. And that's really what jazzes me up about it, so. That is weird. 
to love I know. <laughs> yes, that's a very odd love, but we are going to hold on to you. But we also have, um, and because Seldwin is not, not down on my main, my main screen, I forgot this brother, this man. And so you're going to hear the accent change, right? So this is my Jamaican brother, Seldwin Selo. Morgan, how are you, Selwyn? No, Selwyn didn't bother send us a bio, so you don't see him on this, but he's a part of the program. Now, Selden, Selwyn is, and you're going to correct me because I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself right now before we go back to Felipe. Selwyn is a, an independent contractor, and Selwyn, you work um, where? Where primarily do you? Yeah. We can't hear Selwyn. You're on mute. I know. We have to get a t-shirt that says you're on Press the mute thing on your screen. Yes, because I've been having issue with it. Um, my bad. Uh, so yes, hello everybody. My name is Selwyn Morgan, and uh, yes, I'm based out of Wilmington. So I have a small property maintenance company. Carla, I have to pay my insurance pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's just startup business for me. You know, it's um, me getting out in that independent world, but. You know, business wise, business wise is good. Business wise, everything is good. You know, uh, originally from Jamaica, originally yeah. from Jamaica, uh, went to the GT Foster College. Mm. Uh, and what else should I say? How I, did you get to Lake Placid? I was a member of the Jamaica Bobsled team. I was one of the drivers. I don't like to. I don't like to mention it because. People don't believe me. But yeah, I was a member of the Jamaica Bobsled team. And you know, missed out on my missed out on my 2018 games by 16 points. I came in behind Great Britain. All right. So that's, that's one of the bummers in my life. But other Seldon, than that, I volunteered at the 1993 Winter Olympics in, in, in um, Lillehammer, Norway. So were you there? No, 1993, I think I was still in my dad and my mom. Yes, I, I was on my way out. Shame, shame. I've just been outed for my age. <laughs> no, you know something? I'm, it's okay. I'm not going to switch the patwa on this, on this, but I will cuss him out later for shaming me. And that's that. Go on. Sorry. I, I interrupted you, Selwyn. We'll come back to you. Felipe, come on. Come on, brother. Introduce yourself real quick. Felipe uh, is uh, seven years old. We're pretty, we're pretty young. You know, we're... We're fresh out of the box. <laughs> yep. I was just born in 93. <laughs> 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 All right, so so we have we have um, so I just want to remind um, before Felipe starts um, running off his mouth, I just want to remind um, our our um, our audience and our guests to to go ahead and put your questions in um, in the chat box. Okay, any questions? I have some questions for the for the panelists, but I would prefer to to privilege your questions. Okay. All right, Felipe, hit it. So how's it going, everyone? So. Uh, exclusively ADK is like a small laser tech startup company that I kind of, I kind of thought of about like two months ago. Um, I just really got tired of my average nine to five job and I wanted something new. I wanted something different. And like coming from the South Bronx, we all have that hustler state of mind. We mm -hmm. always have that. Where can we make money start working for itself? And so like, I, uh, this is, this is what I want to do. And I didn't, I really, uh, I see this community as a land of opportunity, especially Lake Placid, Saranac Lake, the Tri-Lakes region, because like we provide a brand new vision, a brand new uh, look to the community and we bring the diversity to the community. And so I want to like, influence the people that I went to school with that are clothing designers, that are painters, that are um, doing, that are like graffiti artists. I want to bring them up here to the Adirondack so they could show us the different things that they're capable of doing. Thank you. Now I know, so I, we, 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 um, um, Carla is an Adirondack, born and raised in Saranac Lake, right? But Felipe and, um, and Celo are, are, are transplants. Right. Yep. So, Felipe, since you started, since you, since you just finished, why did you decide to stay? So, <clears throat> coming from New York City, especially the South Bronx, there really really wasn't anything for me there. Mm 
there was there was nothing but a uh, really expensive lifestyle. Um, but I didn't really have any family or anything. Ha there was nothing there. And uh, I graduated Paul Smith in 2016. And I just like stuck around because I saw that the cost of living was uh, a lot better in compared to New York City. And I decided to stay because I saw opportunity. I saw what others might just see as a nine to five, you know, just getting through another work day. I see it more of like, all right, let me see how this is kind of done. Maybe I could do it a little bit better and then help my friends and they could join me and we could do it all together. Thank you. Celo. Yeah. Why did you decide to, to stay or make this your home? Yeah. <clears throat> Honestly, I've, while doing Bob said, I've traveled to so many countries. I've traveled to so many countries and, you know, you get the chance to, to somewhat pick and choose. But, you know, I touched down, I touched down in the other end and it was somewhat close to home, honestly. And I- I and tell I, people that and they don't believe me when I talk about how diverse the terrain is in Jamaica and how much where my mother is from in the hills of Jamaica is so much, so really? much, especially keen, especially keen, but sorry, I interrupted you, go ahead. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm like, ah, so cut it short, I met my I met my wife, you know, I met my wife, you know, we met and had had kids and everything. And I'm like, you know what? At that time I was still traveling back and forth, even though I had, you know, I had a little boy and everything, and I was traveling back and forth. But I, you know, I just say, you know what? Let me put this paperwork in after I finish my after I get through to the Olympics, but I missed out on that. So I just had to do it, but that's that's my goal. That that was that was my big reason. It was more like home. Yes. All right. So I'm going to jump right into some some of the more challenging questions because we don't have a long time. But I want you to ask you each. And so so Carla, we'll begin with you. What were the opportunities as well as the challenges you faced, and specific to your 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 race in the Adirondacks, if there are any, if there were any opportunities and challenges, as well as challenges, if they, are, they were any? Well, I feel like because it was, a, you know, I grew up in a really small community um, here in Lake Placid that I, I just feel like I had a lot of opportunity to work. And so from the time I was 12, I worked. I babysat, then I worked in a hotel, then I worked, you know, I, I have never stopped working. And I feel like that's a, a beautiful thing, honestly, because a lot of people don't have that ex ability to, to, to just, I mean, I could call somebody up and work tomorrow because I know people. And so the good thing is, is you can build amazing relationships in these communities where people will help you. And so in terms of diversity, I feel like, yes, I had some... Um, you know, I was probably uh, sexually harassed at times, I will be honest, but, you know, uh, and I am probably the, the token African American, you know what I mean? There weren't, there was like nobody else when I was young, but I do feel like people here are, if you show them that you're a hard worker and that you're a good person, that for the most part, you're gonna do well. I haven't, I haven't had horrible, horrible, horrible experiences here. I'm not gonna say I've never heard the N word. I'm not gonna, I have, but I think that, um, I think I've had a really good experience or else I wouldn't be here. Like really. Thank you, thank <laughs> you. Celo, pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly for me, it's, it's been good. Honestly, it's been good. I can't complain, you know, but there, there are times that you know people will say certain things that you just have to you just have to put them in a box by themselves. Where I can give you an example, 2015, we we were here, we me and my teammates were here like back in the spring, and we're walking down, walking down Main Street, and I don't know this jeep pull up with this with these kids. And they threw, they threw like uh, Oreo cookies at me and my teammates. So 
we're athletes. We're we're very fast. You know, we're, <laughs> we're very fast. So the we took off at the, the at the jeep. Me and my my teammates we basically took off at the jeep, and the, we're like the the stop at the stop sign. I don't know if you know down by Robos. If you guys know down that side. No, no, I don't know, but keep going. Okay, but you know, the, the light went red and we were catching up to the Jeep and we're like, dude, we're just stopping to give you back your cookie, basically. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Yes, that is good. That is a perfect response, yes. Good for you. Perfect yeah. response, yes. Good for you. You know, we don't, you know, we, I'm Jamaican, you know, our motto is out of Out of many one people, there you, you go. Know, we don't really see certain things then. You know, for me, it was it was very different. Mm -hmm. It was very different, and that was my first year. Yeah, you know, in the country. So, okay. But Thank other you. than that, yeah. I'll leave it at that. We have one question from the audience, but I'm going to ask Philippe, Philippe to pick that up. The question: Do you want me to repeat? And then we're going to go to the the audience question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, for me, for me, it's I have a very different perspective because I'm a light skinned Hispanic. And so to most people, they think I'm white. And I sound white, I speak I apparently white, which is just educated I, for, for some reason. But English is not my first language. Spanish is my first language. I got the certificate and everything to prove it. Um, but it's really nice about being in that position is that it gives me the ability to educate people and kind of put myself um, in a position where I could hear their frustration and kind of hear like the issues and and why certain things uh, can seem racist, even though they're not racist themselves. And so that's what's really nice about uh, about what I can do is like I, I put myself in a position that that others cannot. And so I, I feel kind of like privileged in that sense to be able to do that. Yes, yes. I tell people all the time, I feel like it's a privilege to be able to do what I love and make a living at it at the same time, right? Because I'm a, an activist in, outside of work. I have other activism that I am. But, but it's, it, I also feel um, very privileged to be able to do this work here because so many in the Bronx, so many members of our communities don't have, um, are not able to leave. They can't leave. They can't uproot themselves and, and start in somewhere where the standard of living is so much better, right? Um, so like when, when, when you ask like, what was my difficulties? One of my biggest difficulties was finances. Like uh, my mentor paid the $120 round trip ticket for me to go visit my college, to visit Paul Smith's mm -hmm. and to like, actually sit there and uh, and apply for the application my mentor did that um like I didn't have the money to do that I I was too busy in robotics I was too busy at NYU taking like college level courses because I was trying to accelerate myself you know I, I I didn't have money and so that was like one of the biggest like one of the biggest blessings because um I had the ability to learn and grow and mature that way. But at the same time, it's like, it's a huge setback when you try and compare yourself to other people. Exactly, exactly. Now, um, uh, so you picked up on, on what was gonna be my next question, but also ties into the, the audience question. Someone asked, what resources were most helpful to you when starting your business in the North Country? So Cello, I'm gonna go back to you and we'll, we'll round up with, with Carla. What, what resources were most helpful to you when starting your business in the North Country? Honestly, it's the support of my wife, you know, the support of my wife, you know, she, she, she held it down for me. That's, that's for sure. She held it down for me. And I was, I was working at the Lake Placid Lodge. I was working at the Lake Placid Lodge. And I, you know, I can remember when this whole pandemic thing come around and, uh, you know, we, they said, okay, they're going to give us a stimulus check. So in my head, I'm like, I'm not going back. I'm not going to back, go back to work with people, you know? So I'm not going to go back to work with people. And I literally used that check to start, to basically start my business. I use it to do the LLC. I use it to do everything. Wow. Every single thing. So just the, just the help, just the, 
the little nudge. That's all, some, that's, that's all you need sometimes, just a little nudge and the confidence to move. Mm-hmm. You know? I remember, I remember it just, just the nudge, mm-hmm. that, honestly. Just, just access and availability of resources. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you. Carla. Um, I uh, went to a, a meeting at the library in Saranac Lake and it was a small business administration meeting. And they had brought together um, different people to the meeting. So they had a bank, they had you know the person from the SBA. And for me, that was really helpful because I had, you know, I worked at the Wilkins Agency for so long. I had my boss as my mentor to help me with, you know, insurance things transitioning, but I didn't really have a good overview top down of just all of the things you have to set up, the LLC, the workers comp, the just all of the things you need to have employees and everything like that. And where do you get funding? And so the SBA meeting was, it was, it was kind of like a light and it really helped to make me feel like I was demystified and I could move forward. Mm -hmm. So that was really important. I encourage anybody who's opening a business to contact the local SBA because they really do a good job. Small Business Association. Y'all do yeah. so many acronyms in the- I don't Sorry. Know. <laughs> yeah, for real. NYSERDA and <laughs> right. FBI. Yeah. So there's another question and I'm going to round this down, round this down with one more question before we move to our next um, set of panelists. Um, how did you build the networks you needed to start or run your business? And I'm going to go back to you, Carla, since you, you finished up. How did you build the networks you needed? And, but, but you were always here. You were born and raised, so your network has kind of um, evolved organically, right? It and was. I'm assuming, yeah. No, it really was. I mean, I, I was really lucky because I'm, I'm taking over a business that, A, I worked at for mm-hmm. 22 years before yeah. I purchased. And, you know, and so I really already had a lot of that networking down. I didn't suffer in that at all. So, sorry. No worries. <laughs> Same question. How did you build the networks you needed to start or run your business. And you talked about getting assistance, financial assistance. Um, so that's one resource, but what kind of network did you need? Did you, are you building those networks? And, and you know, how did you do that? You're muted. I'm I'm tell you, I'm getting a okay. t-shirt printed, go ahead. So I would like to say I'm still in the process of building those networks, but um, in a matter of one month, uh, just like communicating with people that live in town and just throwing ideas of like m- my friends that work in uh, for the Lake Placid uh, community or um, people just start reaching out to me. So like the Strand Center for the Arts, they reached out to me to build an entire makerspace environment for them. And I started de- developing like all these connections, like little by little. And it, it, it kind of happens very fluidly but you have to be open to having that dialogue and you have to be open to having those conversations and expressing your ideas and asking for help, which is possibly one of the most hard headed things that I, I have difficulty doing is asking for help. Yes, a clue is more, don't get fed. People say I talk a lot, but I am, I am the biggest beggar ever because the work has to be done. And if you don't ask, you are not going to get. And if you don't ask, you won't know that services and support are out there, right? Um, so Celo, you know, how did you build the networks? Because you just started. So if you're talking about the, 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 the stimulus check was the impetus to starting the business, you must have yeah. gotten a really nice check. Sorry, that's what I thought, damn. This man got a very nice check. I think I got $400. Yeah, <laughs> Celo, take it away. <laughs> Well, honestly, I'm still in the work. Honestly, you know, I'm still, I'm still working out my kinks. I'm still trying to get everything part. But I would say, you know, the people that the people that you know, the people mm-hmm. that you know, you know, you tell ten person, that ten person will tell another ten. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you do a good job, you know, in in my in my line of work, you have to do a good job. That's how that's how I realize that I get jobs because mm-hmm. someone will do a job and they don't do a good job. Yes, that's the that's that's how I get jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have like three properties that I take care of now that 
it's basically someone someone job I took. But the thing is, just do a good job and you'll 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 see it coming. It will come right. That's why it is tiny ADK. Tiny ADK. It's the tiny. little things that matter. Tiny little. ADK. Well, yeah. and, and the, the Adirondacks might seem huge because it's 6.5 million acres, but but the, it's comprised of tiny close-knit communities. Yeah. You know, that's how I see it. Tiny yeah. close-knit communities. And and I really believe that that change happens one-on-one. -on -one. And that's yeah. why training um, the ADI 100 is so important because it's about it's about educating your neighbors um, to have those conversations, right? Your neighbor, your doctor, your fireman, your you know, your, your property manager, your, the person who is going to do the leather stuff for ADI kids when they come up in June 28th, right? Yes. And, and Carla, we might need some insurance, but you need to work that out for us because you love this insurance thing. But yes. So um, uh, finally, I have one quick question before we shift, shift gears. Um, and this one is, 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 is challenging, right? So you're here as we, we, we did a call for, for um, members of BIPOC communities who were entrepreneurs and business owners, right? Now, um, we're living in, in another moment of racial reckoning. Many people are calling this the, the third civil rights movement, right? So the first was reconstruction. The second was 1964, the passing of the Civil Rights Act. And now um, George Floyd has, has caused a racial reckoning, but, but it's also a political reckoning, right? It's a racial, political, and health crisis reckoning, you know, convalence of multiple things. How do you... Um, speak for yourself, for other communities, and, and articulate justice and racial justice and equity while still being able to keep your customers. Because, because that's, a, that's a very, remember we talked about 6.5 million acres, right? Small, tight-knit communities. So, so there's always the big risk. If you live in a community and there are only what, Saranac Lake is how much, 5,000 plus people? half of whom are second home owners. So you're talking about maybe three, 2,500 people who live here. And out of that, a, a, a portion of them are your bits. So you're risking your livelihood. What kind of, how have you ever been able to, to have to make that choice to, to take a stand, one? And if you did, how did you do it? And, 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 and what advice can you give others? who are sitting in the wings and say, you know what? I wanna be a part of something. I want to be a part of a justice movement. I wanna be a part of an equity movement. I wanna be a part of a racial justice movement. Yeah, but I'm afraid because I live in a tiny, tiny, small town. Go ahead, Carla. Yes, I'm afraid. Yes, I don't say anything. I keep my mouth shut. And I do that because I know that probably more than 50% of the people that are in this community, and this is just me speaking from my own percentages of living here my entire life, don't love people of color, mm. of any color. And so for me, I just keep my mouth shut, I keep my head down, I do my job. I'm just gonna be honest, and that's the, that's the um, coward of me. Mm. I would love to be a part of something but I don't think it will be well received and I don't want to lose everything I have. And I'm, I'm just being honest with you. Got you. And um, I don't know how you guys feel, but that's how I feel. That's it. See, honest. Thank you, Carla. Now I've been told that I need to wrap this up. Um, if you ever watch Dave Chappelle, he has a skit with a wrap it up box. Yeah. I used to use that for one of my professors at Syracuse University. When you got into that room, he just ran his mouth off. And I do that sometimes. So somebody told me to wrap it up. All right. So I'm not going to ask the other two um, males in the room about this. I'm, we're going to move on. And I apologize, folks. But, but you know them. They're entrepreneurs. Seek them out and ask them those questions yourself. OK? This is a moment for you to recognize and acknowledge your community members. And they're open and honest and willing to take your calls. Am I right, y'all? There we go. Yes. Yeah. OK, so next. Thank you so much for joining us. Now we're going to invite um, uh, um, the CEO, the executive director of, of the Adirondack North Country Association, um, um, Patrick Murphy. Did I get you right? Patrick Murphy is the, um, the director for the Saranac Lake Area Chamber of Commerce. And, um, and Katrina uh, is the um, camp director. Katrina, I know I got that wrong the camp director for Eagle Island Camp, my Eagle Island Camp family that I've been working with for a year 
on their culture consciousness um, development. And they are very, very dedicated. And they're going to be supporting and receiving um, 20, no, 20 kids from the Bennington School um, in the Bronx on the 28th, as well as um, 10 from the, from the local area who have been paired with them. So go ahead. So um, Kate, why isn't your face down here? It is. It is? Let's well, I see it. I see it. <laughs> Good. All right. So, so I'm going to start. Do you see me now? Okay, there yeah, I am. I'm going to start with my with my executive director here at Anka, but she's she's much more than that. She's she's really, really, really has become kind of my caregiver and my support <laughs> system. You know, Mesa? Yeah. So um, so 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 I want to start with I'm gonna be biased and start with Kate. Kate, please give a quick introduction to yourself. And y'all know you didn't, you don't have a whole lot of time because I spent too much time with the other group. Yeah, so. no problem. Um, so I'm I work with Anka and we are in the very privileged position of kind of housing, hosting, and really the most important thing is learning from uh, the Adirondack Diversity Initiative, including Nikki. And and it's been um, you know, for us at, at Anka, it's been a, a revolutionary learning process that we've gone through. Um, you know, we have been, uh, we were a, an all white staff when Nikki joined and, um, and she's just brought an incredible insight into the unexamined assumptions that we all have, you know, no matter who we are um, about people and process, et cetera. So um, I think Danny, you introduced Anka very well, the, the three major focus areas that we, that we deal with, but the diversity equity and inclusion agenda is a core part of our mission as well. Um, you know, as Danny said, our mission is an economy that works for all. And we chose those words deliberately and intentionally because we realized that the economy as it's currently configured only works for a few. And it is criti it's imperative that we change the dynamic so that more and more people can participate actively in um, you know, viable quality of life and um, income levels and career paths and jobs and work, et cetera. And, um, and that needs to include, and you know, we're very intentional about building the um, much greater involvement of the BIPOC community in our North Country, which is just massively white at this point. So it's it's been a, a wonderful experience to uh, so far to be on um, learning from Nikki and learning from the whole process. And when we get to it, I'm I'm happy to give some examples of um, of how we've begun to incorporate our learning into the way we hire people and the way we manage our operations so thank you thank you kate thank you so um i'm katrina so katrina and i um when we, when i just came here katrina and i think it was um um marianne amy Mary, amy sought me out right they sought me out and i want to tell you so really quickly why we why we chose these three um groups agencies and people to join us is because they have been intentional intentional about um, centering diversity, equity, and inclusion in their organization and the relationships they have with the community. And, and, and all three are at the entry point of doing this work, different stages of that. But this is what we wanted to show. We wanted to talk to people who were entering in to intentionality where it concerns diversity, equity, inclusion for the organization and the relationships they have with the community, right? So Katrina, I just, I just keep you up. Yeah. Go ahead, introduce uh, yourself. So I am the camp director and assistant executive director for Eagle Island Camp. And we are a youth summer camp in the middle of Upper Saranac Lake. Um, our mission is in everything we do, we believe in inspiring and empowering young people to be confident, collaborative, and courageous. And that mission right there means we have to be open and push ourselves and to do the work to help with gaining more diversity because no one can be confident, collaborative, and courageous if they don't first feel safe. And you can only feel safe if you feel welcome. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to front load and say that I recognize that I myself am a cisgendered white woman and that comes with a lot of privilege and I can only speak from that point of view. And our organization right now, we are 
going to be having our first summer of overnight camp because the governor just said that that can happen this yes. summer. So we're excited. Freedom. Um, so this awesome. will be our first summer and therefore we only really have a board right now. We're working on hiring all the camp staff right now. And our board is very uh, cisgender, white, privileged women. So we are working on um, finding ways to welcome more people into the Eagle Island organization because in order for a camper to feel safe and welcome, they need to see themselves in the staff. And in order, order for the staff to feel safe and welcome to provide that space for a camper, they have to see themselves in the leadership. So we know we have a lot of work to do. And that's why we've been working with Nikki and taking a cultural consciousness course, as well as other summer camp resources to get there. Thank you so much, Katrina. Before um, we get to um, Patrick, I just wanna tell you when you see the 110 kids walking through Saranac Lake or Keene or wherever, say hi, say hi. They're coming up from the Bronx. They're gonna be with their partners, their local partners, and they're gonna be converging on the park, okay? And, and so Patrick, hit it, go ahead. Thanks, Nikki. Um, Patrick Murphy, and I'm the executive director of the Saranac Lake Area Chamber of Commerce. And um, our mission is to act as a catalyst for business and community development. And what we as an organization has had to come and reckon with is how do we not only help develop our business community, but develop the community holistically and how, uh, how do we as an organization fit into this conversation of being welcoming and uh, being able to include um, diverse views and backgrounds, not only with the visitors who are coming here, but with the folks who we want to become new residents here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, working with you, Nikki, um, last summer when that racist graffiti was found here in, in Saranac Lake, we as an organization and individually as people needed to realize that we can't hide behind what we might personally think um, when we're home alone and rationalize it off as people thinking things and doing things uh, in the community, but that's not me. We have to be able to stand up and, and actually speak out when the time is presented to us. We can't hide behind um, uh, other people going out and doing the work. We have to step up ourselves and be able to, to do that. So um, uh, the chamber, um, and I'm very proud of our board getting fully behind this and, and wanting to you know, dive into these conversations or open to um, working through these conversations and issues and how they present themselves within the business community, but more as in the community uh, holistically. So that's you know, where we are and, and we, we've done a number of different things you know, to get this conversation started, but it really started back then talking with you, on, you know, re recognizing that as an organization that's a, a leader in the community needing to, to you know, talk more about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start back with you since, since you just finished. What are some of the things that you have done and, and, and what did they reveal, in, especially about the challenges of, of even entering into um, a strategic vision for diversity, equity, and inclusion for your organization? Well, um, first we have to look at who, who we have in the organization, who's making up the organization, who's making some of those decisions about what projects and initi initiatives and community conversations the organization has at their disposal. So that's our staff and our board of directors. And that's first and foremost, what we need to look at. And so we formed a working group within the chamber to ask ourselves, you know, where are we on the spectrum of, uh, you know, DEI work? And what are some things that we as an organization want to think about more? And um, so we, we, we looked at our board, you know, it, we're a small organization. We have two paid staff and, and 13 volunteer board members. So we needed to look at, you know, how, what's the diversity like on our board? Not only diversity when it comes to race, but diversity when it comes to gender, diversity mm -hmm. when it comes to types of businesses and diversity when it comes to uh, where people geographically come from, from our board. Cause we have a service area that's, you know, rather uh, expansive that can, that ranges from Tupper Lake to Lake Placid to folks in Malone even too. So where, you know, are the people who are our constituents and who are we representing, you know, within our organization. So that's, you know, one thing that we did right off the bat. We um, identified that we wanted to put on paper what our values are and what we hold to be important to us. and 
equity and taking action and um, being a transformative organization or values that we put up front and center and are published and, and available for folks to review and for members to look at. And we're, um, we want our members to understand that that's the value of the organization. When they become members, that's what they're signing up to be a part of as part of our organization is to have those types of values. And that it will be a, a guidepost for us when we move forward to continue uh, a conversation. And, and we're starting to have that working group think of uh, tangible steps we need to take and to write those out and put them on paper about where, where we wanna go and what are we gonna do to get there. Thank you, thank you. Now I wanna, I wanna, I'm gonna jump to Kate. So Kate, talk to, talk to, to us about what has ANCA done um, to, to, to intentionally move into a strategic um, vision for diversity, equity, inclusion. Okay, so, so um, I, I'm gonna uh, borrow the words of our new president that words matter. Yes. And um, we have made some very significant commitments and I always feel like, you know, you put a stake in the a sand, put a stake, you know, out there, and then it draws the organization along through that process. So the first thing we did after the George Floyd murder was to make a very strong statement standing with Black Lives Matter. And, um, you know, we definitely took some heat on that, but I, we felt, and our, our board felt that it was a really important um, a position for us to take that we could not stand quietly and and you know kind of as Patrick as you said you know it, well it, we didn't do it so we so so that was the first thing I uh, I think the second thing was again um, looking at our board you know we had one uh, person on the board uh, who can't, comes from an indigenous community but other than that it was very white um, I, I assume mostly cisgendered. And um, so we reached out, we, we, you know, working with Nikki and others, um, we invited three black people to join the board and two accepted. So that was really exciting. So we're, you know, kind of building the diversity on the board. And at their first board meeting, we had developed a, um, a resolution for the board and the staff to commit to very specific steps on diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, bringing both the board and staff along. And then the the, the last thing we did was a statement um, in the wake of the Ju uh, January 6th riots, um, where we just said, you know, white supremacy and a democratic process are inherently incompatible. And ANCA stands behind democratic process. We actually lost a board member over that. But so, so we've done that in terms of words matter. Um, the, the other thing is staff has begun to go through a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, uh, awareness program, which is wonderful. You know, we do it on Zoom. Everybody participates, except for Nikki. Um, <laughs> you know, this is for the white folks on the staff. And um and it's and it's been that it's I think it's been a really important process. One of the things that happens is just the the openness and honesty and kind of vulnerability that you end up sharing with each other because we're all, you know, we all come from a position of privilege or set of assumptions of some sort and to kind of extract those and bring those out. And then the other thing that's really exciting to me is that the language of diversity, equity, and inclusion is now in our job description. So we're in a fortunate position to be able to continue to hire people. At ANCA, we're up to about, I think, 16 uh, staff members. And uh, in, a, in the recent, you know, we're hiring a new person in the energy team. And actually the staff worked with Nikki to make sure that there are no um, signals in the job description that we posted that basically would say, only a certain kind of people are invited to, um, to apply. So we changed some of the language and I'm happy to share you know, specifics with anybody who wants to know what that is. The upshot is of the three people that we are interviewing for the final, um, you know, who are kind of in the final cut, uh, two of them bring um, uh, diversity. I'm not, I won't go into detail at this point because 
you know, we haven't hired them yet and we haven't, you know, gone through the whole process, but we were, we were very um, pleasantly surprised by the um, uh, diversity of the folks, the people who had applied to the, to, for the job. So it, when people see, and again, back to words matter, when they see that made explicit in the job description, it invites a broader set of people to apply for those jobs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, um, Katrina, I apologize because I just was just told that we have now have two minutes. So I'm giving you one minute and we were not, we're not able to go on to some of the questions that talked about. Okay, so how, now that you, you've articulated in language, how do you translate it in action? But Katrina, okay. go ahead. So, yeah. Sorry. Really quick rapid fire. Uh, the first thing that we did is back in 2019, we were able to open for day camp only. We made sure that we were using inclusive language to start. So we worded it as all gender day camp. So that right up front, let people know that that is what we stand behind. Uh, from there, we worked on making more inclusive job descriptions and our hiring process, as Kate just said. Most important thing we found was putting the salary right at the top, being upfront and clear about that, breaking down the barriers as much as possible. We redid the wording on our website and on our hiring process to explain step-by-step -step. applicants receive a full packet of what to expect, some of the interview questions, um, how to, tips and tricks on how to be better at your interview, what we expect, what we're looking for, um, and making sure we're using wording that welcomes them in instead of setting up unintentional barriers. So do that, we ran it by a whole lot of eyes to see who would catch what we weren't seeing because we didn't mean to. Um, as Nikki mentioned, we're also taking a cultural consciousness course uh, with her. We've also been working with Transplaining, which is a summer camp um, organization that is specifically helping with gender inclusiveness for summer camps. Um, and we also just made sure that we are now creating the physical space to follow up all the things that we just promised. So because we're saying all gender, we're making sure that we have um, None of our bathroom spaces are gendered in any way. So that means individual stalls so everyone feels safe. Changing rooms in every cabin so that no matter how you identify, you have a private space to change so you feel safe living in that space. Uh, making sure that all of our uh, signage and all of the processes from when you arrive on the island is as welcoming and um, breaking down jargon. So I'm sending uh, definitions to all of the words that we tend to use to all applicants families and staff and campers so that if I accidentally use camp jargon, they have that definition in front of them to help them feel like they're in on the back end, that they, as soon as you feel like you're part of the inside joke, you start feeling more welcome. So telling them that before they even arrive, just something. Thank you. And I just wanna, wanna, wanna say before we get booted out of this, this room is that um, the, the, there's something that each of these organizations have done that makes this unique and intentional is they started internally. They started looking at what kinds, what, how could they expand their cultural consciousness and their cultural competency? Okay, so that's it. But I want to give um, thank you so much, all of you. I know this was fast and people didn't even get their questions in, but I want to give like a, a snarky shout out to Peter Burns. He took his photo off of there. Peter is from my last job at Manhattanville College and he snuck in. I don't know how he got in here, but Peter, hi. I think he has a house in the Adirondack somewhere. <laughs> but thank you all for your time. This has been so powerful. Um, remember, if you have questions, if, if at these, all, all, every, uh, all of our panelists are available. I can't promise you I will respond to your email, but my beautiful, fierce, wonderful First Nations um, admin manager will pick up the phone and respond on my behalf. Yes, thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Nikki, thank you so much. And for those of you who are going to go to the next session, um, it is on GoToWebinar. Please look in your email for the link from the SBDC. So not on the Zoom one, please look in your email for the SBDC link. Thank you everybody. And Nikki, you are amazing. Thank you all of our panelists and have a great night. See you at the next one. Cheers to the Thank freaking you. weekend. Have a good one guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>